Hey, welcome to another Enneagram podcast. Just got your host Ryan here this week, and that is because we are going to play an episode uh, today of another podcast called Insurance Town. And Insurance Town is, uh, well, as you might have guessed, a podcast by a guy that does insurance. However, the reason we're playing it for you today uh, is because he had me on there to do a little interview, and it was awesome. It went really well. We honestly didn't talk about insurance very much. We more talked about how the Enneagram can be used in a business setting. And so we wanted to play that for you here today. So enjoy this episode of Insurance Town. Hey, 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 and welcome to Insurance Town. I'm the Mayor Heath Sheeran and the host of this podcast. Today, guys, I'm super excited about my guest because what he's going to talk about today has become a new fashion of mine, a new somewhat obsession of mine, really. But before I get to that, I want to say thank you guys for all the love and support, for the downloads, for subscribing, for telling your friends. And I'm also excited if you missed the announcement, we are now on iHeartRadio. Super cool. I feel like I've arrived now, but uh, enough about me. So today's guest is Ryan Mayfield of Evergreen. I put a post out there a couple of weeks ago asking if anybody would be interested in learning more about this uh, since it's become so important to me and something that I have found fascinating. And overwhelmingly, a lot of you said yes. A lot of you emailed me. A lot of you have sent me text messages. said, yes, find somebody that knows about the Enneagram. I would love to learn more. So I did that. I found Ryan Mayfield, who is uh, the owner of Evergreen. What they do is they uh, consult and work with large and small companies to build their team using the Enneagram. You're going to hear more about it. Again, it's fascinating to me. I'm all in, guys, and I really want to share this with you. So without further ado, please sit back, relax, and enjoy my conversation with Mr. Ryan Mayfield. Hey, Ryan, how you doing, bud? Doing okay. Yeah? How's COVID treating you? Man, uh, it could be a lot worse. You know, it's obviously not fun, but uh, I've got a lot to be thankful for, and yeah, it could be worse. There you go. I know you're a busy guy. I know you got a lot going on, but I do want you to take us down memory lane. Let's tell about your life and uh, what made you who you are. Yeah. So, you know, without making this a 17 hour podcast, I'll try to uh, try to go through some of that. I uh, grew up in Southwest Missouri. Uh, I don't even know if you knew that about me or not, but uh, that's where I, I grew up like when I was really young. I spent all my summers in Oklahoma with my grandparents. Uh, and then after I graduated from high school, moved to Oklahoma and went to school at Tulsa. I uh, got a degree from, from the University of Tulsa. Uh, and then after that, I uh, moved overseas for about four years actually in India. Got to do a lot of cool stuff there. Uh, did everything from coaching uh, co- basketball and professional football to coffee exporting uh, and working with Walmart supplier vendors before moving back to Arkansas. And uh, well, not back to Arkansas. I've never lived here before, but I've been here, uh, gosh, five and a half, six years now. So that's the short version. <laughs> so look, I got to ask you this. Then. What brought you to Arkansas? Was it a female? Was it a job? Was it <laughs> what, what was it that brought you back here? So it was a job. I took a job okay. at a nonprofit here in central Arkansas working in their administrative office. They asked me to come do that. And I also took over the stateside uh, kind of management of the coffee exporting business that I was doing in India. Okay. So I know and why I brought you on the podcast and I'd love for you to try to maybe bridge this gap. I know you, you're at the company Evergreen that you started, but yeah. bridge me the gap here between the coffee business and getting into Enneagram and Evergreen. Can you do that for me? How did that, how did that yeah. happen? That's a big so, gap. It, it is a gap. I realize I left that gap there, but you have <laughs> asked the correct question to get us to across it. So um, I, I guess, you know, it's funny you mentioned the thing about a girl. Uh, so I wasn't brought here for a girl, but uh, as a <laughs> coffee uh, manager slash salesman slash wore a lot of different hats in that role, um, one of the things I was doing was selling uh, wholesale coffee stateside, and there was a local church that I 
had started to get involved in and there was a girl that was running breakfast things for, for them. And I ended up selling her coffee, which was how I met my wife. Uh, and so fast forward a little bit and I actually ended up coming on staff with that same church uh, for a few years as their director of operations. And in the meantime, I had kind of started this side business of Evergreen that you mentioned. Uh, and, you know, you, you've you talked to me before about all the different personality tests and, and leadership profiles and all those things. And over a lot of years, I have sat on the receiving end of those trainings, whether that's DISC or Myers-Briggs or Strengths Finders or Berkman or this or that or the other, are you a dog or a beaver or a lion, you know? Um, and, um, and so I, <laughs> while I was on staff with that church, um, we went through one uh, that was kind of similar, but it was around the idea of the Enneagram. And so from there, um, I, you know, one of the things that I would say is a strength of mine is that I uh, am good at teaching things. I enjoy teaching people. And so people would ask me to come and start teaching this Enneagram stuff to them and to their teams or whatever group they were part of. And so at some point I decided, Hey, I should make this at least a side business. And then at some point I thought, I think I can take this into a full blown, you know, deal. And so I did and eventually transitioned off of staff with the church to start uh, full time with Evergreen. So I, I can I can relate to you on some of this, which is fascinating. And like I said earlier, off the air, you and I have I learned something new about you every time I talk to you. But <laughs> I spent six years of my life in full time vocational ministry, and I like you went through so many different personality tests, and every single one of them. You know, I think it's funny about my personality. I always rank off the charts in one thing. I think that's just my extremist personality. Like with the disc, I was a high I, like off the charts I. And then I took, uh, and we'll get to this in a minute, but I took the Enneagram and I was like 103% three. And so it's like, you know, I had these like big personality things. But I guess the first question I would ask you before we get into some of that is Evergreen. Is there a reason behind that name? How did you come up with that? Uh, it's an interesting name. And the spelling, guys, is like the E-V-R-G-R-N. Hooked on phonics didn't work for you, I guess. But <laughs> tell me, how, how did how did that come up with that name? Uh, it's a great question. So, you know, Evergreen, the name uh, came after about, I feel like, six weeks of smacking my head against a whiteboard trying to come up with something decent. And um, eventually came around to that idea because – uh, so I, what I wanted to do was consult with with teams, business teams mostly. And the thing that was appealing about an evergreen is that evergreens are, you know, evergreen, right? They are green, whether it's summer or winter, right? They thrive in every season, which is the tagline for the business is that I help people craft teams that thrive in every season. And so that's why it's called Evergreen. As for why it's missing a couple of vowels is because I have a friend who's very smart and works at a marketing agency and suggested that. One, because he said it would look uh, appealing, but two, uh, this is kind of a side effect that I found to be incredibly true, is that it makes it more memorable. People like try to read it and they almost trip over it and have to slow down and ask me what it is. And they tend to remember it better when they don't just breeze right over it. There you go. And so I, I had to figure out that because I was the same way. I tripped over Evergreen. But, uh, okay, so back to the, the ministry conversation for just a moment. Um, would you say, uh, it, you know, I went through all the different personality tests like you. Is there a lot of similarities between the different ones? If I scored an I on the disc and then I was a three on the Enneagram, if I were to pair those together, do you think there's some similarities there? What makes the Enneagram what you leaned forward towards and what you ran with? Because I know that's the basis behind all of Evergreen and what yeah. you do everything with. So yeah, there's kind of two, two different parts to that answer. First of all, um, I don't think that there's a direct correlation between like yeah, if you're a D or a C or whatever on this test, it means you're going to be a, a three or a five on the Enneagram. Um, I think there's probably some, some strong relations, but it's not any guarantee, right? So I think you can be any DISC profile or and any Enneagram number, even though some might skew towards certain things. Does that kind of make sense? Um, so yeah, it does. It does totally. Okay. So 
That said, uh, the reason why I really jumped on with, with Enneagram stuff after going through all the others, um, I don't know if you've had this experience, right, where you do one of those assessments and uh, usually a couple of things happen. First of all, it can be great, right? You can be like, yeah, that's really insightful. Uh, but it can also be not fun at all, right? I don't, I feel like every time I've done one of those, prior to Enneagram stuff, it was like, okay, everybody's got their results and now we're going to go around the room and read them. And everybody talks about how awesome they are. And then you get to mine and it just feels like you're, you know, I read it and it's like, you're a terrible person. You should probably just stop, you know? Uh, and so I don't know if you've had <laughs> right. yeah. that kind of an experience. Um, so, but it, I joke, but it can be helpful, right? But the other thing that tends to happen is you take one of those assessments and it creates some really good conversation, maybe that night, that weekend for a couple of days, but then everybody goes back to what they were doing, right? And so two weeks later, no one cares anymore. And right. when we did Enneagram stuff, um, a week later, we were still talking about it and Two weeks later and four weeks later and three months later, we were still talking about it. And not only well, that, if I could stop you with people. Yeah. yeah. If I could stop you for a minute, uh, you know, my wife and I, after I read all your stuff on LinkedIn, by the way, guys, you ought to follow this guy on LinkedIn if you want to learn more about it. But and I read your articles and I went through it. I finally just told my wife, we're going to take this test and see what this is about. So we found one of those free, free ones on like some website and uh, I took it and we've this has been two weeks ago three weeks ago and we're still talking about it today and like she'll do something as like oh there's the four in you you know coming out or she'll be like oh there's that eight and you or three in you whatever and so you're right when i took the disc I'm like oh i'm, I'm i whatever and somebody would say oh, i'm a d that means i'm dominating I'm a, whatever but yeah. like you said with this because it's so and I want to, I want you to tell more about this because it's so multifaceted and there's so many different circles. And anyway, there's yeah. so much cool about it. It does make you talk about it. And as I told you off air, I sent it on to several of my friends to see what theirs were. And we've been texting back and forth about it. And it's cool to find someone like you that you want to talk about, Hey, here's what I'm dealing with as a three. What do you deal with in this? How do you handle this? You're right. I could see what'd be great for team control, team management and team building. So, um, I guess for the audience that doesn't know anything about the Enneagram, can you tell a little history about the Enneagram? Maybe make it sexy for a minute and talk about it. <laughs> uh, let's go from there a minute before we get into some of the other things. Yeah, for sure. So the Enneagram, if you're not familiar with it, is uh, you could say similar to some of those other personality typing systems like DISC or Myers-Briggs, but it has some some very big differences that kind of set it apart. I even struggle to call it exactly a personality assessment. Um Probably one of the best ways I've heard it described is that the Enneagram gives you kind of nine different lenses through which different people see the world, right? I kind of have my way of seeing the world. You kind of have yours. And so it's not just about personality. It's about who you are at your core and what drives you and what are the intrinsic questions that you ask to try and find your own worth and value and, and uh, how you experience conflict and how you communicate with people. And so it's, like you said, has a lot of different facets to it, but probably the biggest differentiator for me is that where something like DISC, and I'm not trying to knock DISC, I think it has tons of great applications, but where it's hugely different in my opinion is that a lot of those other ones look at kind of external behaviors, like what you do, your, your traits, your actions, right? Your habits. Whereas Enneagram looks a lot more intrinsically or into motivations rather than the external actions. And that's a whole deeper level uh, of, of self-reflection and introspection. Uh, and so it can be really useful for your own personal growth, for relationships, for work. I think that's one of the reasons why it gets talked about so much is because it has such a wide range of applications, not just in your own, but also in your marriages and friendships and personal growth and development. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. And, you know, going back to from what I've read about it, like I said, I'm addicted, not addicted to it, but I'm obsessed with it right now since I took the test a couple of weeks ago. But I understand there's the instinctive center, the feeling center, and the thinking center, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so, and you're right. It, it applies to my marriage. My wife and I talk about it almost every night now. And yeah. then, you know, I, I think about it in my own team and I'm going to talk to my boss about, you know, and you're not going to talk about that off air, but 
And I, I think it would work well with agencies that are listening to this, um, agency owners, principals, anybody's listening. This would be a great opportunity for you to think about your team and how you relate to each other. I think it'd be really cool. But, you know, I wonder, because with Evergreen, you work with not just small companies. You work with restaurants, with colleges, with churches. I mean, it's a wide – tell me about that a little bit, about the different types of people you're working with and how that works and what Evergreen does exactly. Yeah, so I – tell people that I like to work with teams of about five or more, you know, that's not a hard and fast rule, but, but I, I want to work with anybody that cares deeply about company culture, right. About investing in their people in such a way that it kind of raises the bar for everybody. And so that can be uh, like you said, churches or colleges or whatever, but I've also worked with insurance agencies like like you. I've I've worked with uh, restaurants and tax agencies and uh, car wash companies, and I mean just all across the board, any company that cares about investing in its people and building a great culture to work for. That's who I want to work with. Okay, so. With that being said, uh, let's dive in for just a minute. Um, there are nine personality traits, correct? Or how do you say nine, that? Nine. I would say nine uh, basic profiles. Nine basic profiles. And uh, so can you walk through those nine and maybe even give the title, maybe some general characteristics about each one of sure. those? Yeah. And just so we're clear, I mean, I say nine basic profiles because each one of these can splinter down into at least three other profiles. One of them goes down into like six other profiles. I mean, it gets, it gets real granular real quick if you let it, but we won't do that here. Let, let's keep it high level, keep it sexy and keep it fun. <laughs> Absolutely. But yeah, let's, let's dive into these nine because again, they're fascinating. And I'm hoping yeah. that if you're listening to this, you're going to go back and take this after he talks about this and you can relate and go back to this podcast and let's do it again. So the easiest way to go through these at a high level is to talk about kind of the core need of each one, right? Like the main driving thing that each one of these profiles needs in life. And so if we start at the top, if we start with number one, which I'm an Enneagram type one, by the way, uh, and you'll know this just from working with me, you'll, you'll think this is pretty accurate, is uh, Enneagram ones have the need to be right, to be accurate, right? That's their, their driving kind of compulsion, right? And um, right. yeah, they have, they, they have that need. Uh, I'm sure you have experienced <laughs> that uh, working with me. Um, so that's the type one. Type two has the need to be needed, right? T twos need to be needed by others. They really want to serve and help and, and come alongside others, right? Type threes have the need to achieve or to perform, right? They want to look successful and, and get the trophy. You know, that's a type three. So that's me, by the way. I'm going to okay. pause you at three because when I took this, it, it, it's funny that you said it the way you did. Say that again, uh, what you said about the threes. Uh, the type threes, their core need is to perform or to achieve. They want to win, right? If you've ever seen right. um, that movie, what is it, Talladega Nights? I hate yes. that movie. But, um, <laughs> but that's one of the most quotable lines is, what does he say? If you're not first, you're last. If and, you're not first, you're last. That's exactly right. Uh, it's and, funny you say that. Go ahead. Uh -huh. Because I am a three and my wife and I joke a lot because we can't play games together because I take it to that another level and I have to beat her. And yeah. like when I'm playing with my kids, I, I mean, I don't want to beat. I just want to smash their throats in and like I want to <laughs> step on them and be like, I'm killing you. But that's just my personality. I'm success oriented. I, I want, I'm driven to that. I don't want to just do well. I want to do really well. And that doesn't always work out for me. But it's funny you say that in the way you said, I want that trophy and I want that to succeed in that. But that can also have its negative points too, obviously. But um, yeah, so you probably, you know, maybe or may not see that in me as well. But uh, that's my thing. So I'll let you keep going with the fours on. Well, just before we go even too deep into that, just so it doesn't get too complex, like think about if you're trying to motivate people on it. And we've just talked about three of them right now. One of them's motivated by doing things the right way. One of them's motivated by opportunities to help people. And the other one is op is motivated by opportunities to achieve and get rewards and things like that. If you got a team full of people and you're only trying to motivate with rewards and, and stickers and trophies, 
you're only motivating one type of person, right? And so if we will think more holistically about leadership and team development and motivation, that's a game changer. You're exactly right. And I think too many agency principals that are listening to this or managers in the offices don't think or don't think about that. They realize, well, if I'm motivated that way, then everybody's motivated that way. Um, if I want to win and put my foot on someone's throat, everybody does, but that's not yeah. the case. Well, and think about the downstream impact that has on an agency. If the lead agent is that way, then they're probably only going to hire agents that work that way. And they're only going to attract clients who connect with that way of working, right? You're exactly right. Uh, and, and especially in agencies, um, big or small in the insurance world, there's so many different types of personalities that work well in that. You have your customer service people, your sales people who are probably driven more like me. If I got to win, I got to win. I want to hunt and yeah. win. And then you've got your, you know, your people who deal with just the service side of it. And, you know, they want to help when someone's calling about a claim and they, they really need to be empathetic and they need to think a certain way. So I think, you know, already in the first few minutes we've been talking about this, I think there's already a, a seen need there that you could help a lot of agencies in this. But um, I would love for you to continue on with some of this because yeah. I'm already, I mean, I'm all in guys. If you haven't, <laughs> if you can't tell, the mayor is all in on this. I'm loving it. Yeah. So we'll move on then. Type fours, the core need of type fours is to be unique, to be different, right? To bring something, a talent, a skill, a gift that no one else uh, brings to the party, right? If they show up dressed like someone else, somebody's got to go home and change, right? <laughs> um, so It's funny you say that. That's okay. my wife. Yeah, oh, that's my wife. She was a four. And I don't want to call her out too much, but you know, that's exactly what, what it is. It's definitely an interesting standpoint to hear that because I've never thought of it as its own yeah. realm, so to speak. Well, and I'll edit this part out if you want me to, but uh, I'll tell you that one of the most interesting combinations uh, of two numbers is a three and a four. And the biggest yeah. reason for that is because threes, one of a three's superpowers is just the ability to to wear any kind of hat, to, to be the utility player that yeah. kind of shows up and becomes whatever is expected or needed of them. Fours, on the other hand, value like radical honesty and authenticity. And so sometimes I call fours like walking BS detectors. And that's fours, so true, though. The oh fours and threes can struggle sometimes with each other. Because yeah. The threes trying to live up to whatever the expectations are around them. And the fours calling the three out for being fake. Right. Or four. right. Oh, my God. That's I don't want you to edit that out because that's brilliant. Because that's exactly <laughs> What it is. No. Uh, anyway, we'll, we'll figure that out later about editing. Yeah. It. But I think it'd be great to leave it in for my wife's sake. But um, <laughs> anyhow, uh, yeah. I, I love it because that's exactly what it is. She's a BS detector and I can always tell. And this is the way that she and I do work well together. So if you're a three and you have a four on your team, um, we can go into a party and come out of the other side of the party and, or a, an event and she can have a totally different read on the room than I do. And she can be like, yep. that person's full of crap. That person's full of crap. That yep. dude's genuine. Absolutely. You need to go work with that guy. And so when I was selling insurance, she could be able to tell me, okay, that she, he's going to buy from you or they're not. Or, yes. you know, anyhow. So, yeah, I think that would be a great way for a three and a four. And, I, you know, again, uh, I'm you're not trying to steal it. your thunder. But, again, I'm all in, guys. Yeah. No, you're all over it. And that's a great way to align a team like that. The three has to learn that not every, like, thing is worth trying to win and learn to listen to a four like they're a smoke detector, right? It's not a competition about who can stay in the house the longest. It, the smoke yeah. detector is meant to get you out, right? And listen to that. And so that's, um, yeah, a three, four combination can be really tough, but it can also be incredibly like uh, beneficial if it's done right. It's so just good imagine you if that. you knew that going into, oh, you know, yeah. you know, like not, not even saying marriage, but let's say, you know, you right. were an, an agent that hired somebody like that. If you knew that that was her strength versus what your strengths were, I mean, maybe you would get there, but what if you did it five, 10 years earlier than you would have otherwise? No, you're exactly right. Um, so let's, uh, let's move past my wife and I's <laughs> marriage counseling here. <laughs> let's go to five through nine for those yeah. that are, are listening and tired of hearing about me and Stacy. We'll do it. We'll try not to take as many stops along the way. Um, <laughs> no, I love it. This is fascinating. So fives, the core need of type fives is to know, 
right? Uh, that's what they, they're just knowledge sponges. They're the best people to have on your pub trivia team. They just know stuff, right? <laughs> right. Okay. Um, so you got fives. The core need of sixes is the need to be safe or secure, right? They need to know if they can trust their environment, trust the people that are in charge of it or not. Type okay. sevens have a core need um, to, this one is kind of kind of weird. People don't always get this one right away. But for sevens, the core need is to avoid pain or to avoid difficulty. That one's confusing because most sevens are really bubbly and outgoing and fun and boisterous and adventurous. Um, but a lot of times that's done in an effort to, to only focus on the good, fun, exciting parts of life. Right. I'm about to say what I've heard sevens is the enthusiast or they're a fun loving type. They're upbeat. Absolutely. So anyhow, go ahead. Yeah. So they're glass half full kind of people is the thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, so then you move on to the type eights and the core need of a type eight is to be against something or to, to fight for something. Uh, eights are sometimes called the challenger. They're usually really aggressive mm-hmm. and, uh, but, but it's not out of a non caring. It's usually because they're fighting for something that, can't fight for itself. My favorite title for eights is the advocate because they like to advocate for, for people or causes or things like that. Right. Okay. That's a type eight. And then finally the core need of type nine is to avoid conflict. That's, that's the name of the game for nines is to avoid conflict. So they're the peacemaker. Yes, absolutely. Okay. So again, um, if you're listening to this, this is going to be about me for a minute. So I took, (laughs) And some of you listening to this are, are going to ask these same questions because I put this out on Facebook and I've had my phone and my emails and my text messages blow up with people asking me questions and wanting me to ask you certain questions. So I appreciate that, by the way, Insurance Town. Um, so I have, when I took the test, I had high scores. I had high scores in several mm-hmm. different numbers. So how does that work if I scored a, a three? and an eight and a one, how does that, how does that work as just a complementary of each other or how does that right. work? So everybody's complex, right? There's no, no such thing as just a two dimensional person. Our personalities are complex. Um, and, but you have one core Enneagram type that does not mean that other ones are not influential, right? So some people have one that stands out far above the rest. Other people have several that, that resonate pretty deeply with them. How you know what your core type is, is let's say you got yourself into a situation where the core needs of those numbers came up against one another. So let's say you scored high in, in three, seven, and eight, which is pretty common. Uh, and you got into a situation where you had to choose whether or not you were going to be successful, have fun, or you know be a champion of justice for somebody else, right? Let, let's take a race for example, if you were running a race and you see those videos of somebody falling down and another you know, runner picking them up, right? That's a very eight oriented way to do that. You know, a seven might run the race until it's not fun anymore and they might jog the rest or, uh, you know, I, one of my favorite pictures ever was somebody sitting next to a finish line at a race with a, a cooler full of beer and a sign that said free beer for quitters. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, uh, so, you know, maybe a seven might be like, I'm tired of this. I'm going to sit down and have a beer, but a three might decide, no, I'm going to win this sucker. I don't care what other distractions are around me. Let's get across the finish line uh, and, and get that trophy. Right. So once those things came up against each other, you would have to decide which one of those do I care more about? And that would be your core Enneagram type. Okay. And so you could have as, as many as three or four different high scoring types. Is that how that works? I've seen people that have, you know, seven or eight different high scoring ones. Um, and like that's, that's not split like, personality type deal or is it <laughs> always no, that way? Cause it sounds to me like it'd be hard to be, a peacemaker at the same time as someone who's, you know, an achiever who wants to step on people's throats and win. So anyway, go ahead. Well, I mean, it's, so it's not like crazy common for that to happen, but when it does, uh, you're, you're not off the mark there. It can be difficult for those people to make decisions and decide what they're going to do because they feel all of these different things that they're concerned about. Right. Uh, and so that, that does happen. Most of those people, I say most of those, a lot of those people actually tend to end up being 
uh, Enneagram nines. That's one of the superpowers of the nine is that, um, that they kind of see everybody's perspective. And so that's, that can be a difficult spot to be in for sure. Yeah, I could imagine. So, okay. So I, I'm not the same guy that I was in my twenties, correct? Just like you're probably not the same guy you were in your twenties. Right. So does someone number change as they evolve into different positions in their company or different parts of their life from, you know, being a 20 year old to a 40 year old or being an agent, so to speak, in an agency to being now the office manager or the principal agent. Now they're the boss. Right. Can those numbers change? Can that happen? So your numbers don't change, but the way you express that number absolutely does. Right. So most people will say that at least in our modern Western society, you kind of settle into whatever your personality or your number is around the age of 20, right? In our, in our culture, 20 is about, you know, give or take about the time when you kind of, you know, quote unquote, find yourself. It's when most kids get out from underneath mom and dad's roof and start having to make decisions on their own. Uh, and 20 is definitely the age where you know the most, right? Uh, and so, <laughs> You know, 20, 20 year olds always have all the answers. The older you get, you kind of learn that, oh, maybe I didn't know quite as much. <laughs> and, um, and so what happens is 20 is typically the age that I prescribe for people to try and think about when they are trying to figure out what their Enneagram type is, because that's the age where they were expressing it the most unashamedly for most people, right? As you get older, you learn that, oh, that doesn't always work super well. And so you have to kind of scale it back a little bit and temper it a little bit. And so the number doesn't change, but the way you express it absolutely does. Okay, cool. I, I wondered that because I know as I've changed through the years, but I also know in agencies, if you move up in different positions, I would think that you would have to change some of your management style and maybe that's just to fit other numbers and maybe you'll get into that, which leads me into... Go ahead. Well, well, just let me say, remember, it's about internal motivations, not external okay. actions, right? And okay. so your actions can change just because you are a three and somebody else is a three doesn't mean that your actions are going to be anything alike. It just means that your motivation is going to be very similar. And so your actions absolutely change, but your motivations usually don't. That's good. That's good. Um, okay. So lead me into, okay, Evergreen the company mm -hmm. that he has got based around the Enneagram, everything you do is based around the Enneagram. And I know, talk to me a minute, you work in leadership, communication, teamwork, conflict management, um, hiring and firing and all kinds of things. Um, why don't you, can you give me just a, a, a overview, maybe a minute or two overview of what exactly you do for companies and corporations yeah. as they've heard you talk? So Evergreen provides uh, training resources and, and ongoing development for teams to help like build and maintain healthy teams, teams that work together well, that communicate well, that love their jobs. Right. And uh, so in doing that, I also work with those team leaders to help them lead their teams better to craft the way they communicate with their teams, uh, how they respond in times of stress, things like that. So it starts with, with a big team training. And then I do ongoing development every month with those teams, whether it's a one hour training meeting or one-on-one -on -one leadership coaching with the team leader. Uh, and so that, as well as, you know, several other avenues that I provide those different resources and training and things to those teams. Now, is this a year long process, like two years, five years, six months? I mean, how long is it just however long different contracts? It's month to month for everybody. So okay. I, it's not a thing that has an end date on it. As long as you have a team, you're always going to find your team in new circumstances. Your team is always going to be growing and having, you know, different people come in and out of it. And so that's a big part of it too, is that I do onboarding training for any new hires that people bring in. That's another problem that, that people have with stuff like disc or whatever. If you pay somebody a you know, $10,000 to come do something. Like that. And then you hire three new people the next month who don't know what you're talking about. And so the language gets phased out. And so for my monthly clients, anytime they hire someone new as part of their contract, I put their new hires through the same training that their team got at the beginning so that everybody's using the same language. If you don't, okay, do that, so it's eventually going to die out. Okay. So uh, tell me from what I gather, Y'all do pre-employment interviews, and I've heard three words 
hungry, humble, and smart. Can you talk about that a little bit? Absolutely. So, you know, I can't take credit. I wish I could for hungry, humble, and smart. Uh, that comes from uh, one of my very favorite like leadership and, and teamwork gurus, a guy named uh, Patrick Lencioni, uh, who is out of California. And he has a, a book called The Ideal Team Player. And it is unbelievably good, but that's where hungry, humble, and smart comes from. And so that combined with Enneagram assessments is one of the main ways that I do uh, some of that pre-employment and hiring stuff, making sure that this person is a right fit for your culture and that you have them in the right seat for their strengths, weaknesses, proclivities, things like that, and can already start the process of being a good teammate even before they're officially part of the team. Okay. So that also with that pre-employment interviews and you've got the training and you're doing all these things, to me, it sounds like it'd be really easy to follow all this when things are good and everything's on a high and you get through all the training. And But do you work with these teams on when things get tough, when they go through hard times? Or do you, do you work with them on some of this stuff too? Yeah, so it's funny that you would ask that right now. I, I obviously can't say who the client is, but I'm working with a firm right now who uh, is in the middle of removing one of the partners for the firm. Uh, and and I would honestly say that I have been able to bring more value to this client than any that I've ever worked with. I, I talk with them multiple times a week and have helped guide a lot of those conversations on both sides of it um, with both of the partners in the firm and have helped with that, that process to make that exit um, as am as possible and to make sure that the team stays encouraged and doesn't uh, get defeated through all this and to help everybody get out the other side better. So I would imagine in that situation, and again, any situation, when you use that as an example, or you can just speak in broad terms, anytime you have two leaders like that, partners or whatnot, they have two different leadership styles and two different followings, so to speak. You know, I guess there's a lot of work in that as well. And, you know, how, how you go about working with that with two different leadership styles. So what's great is for these companies I work with, I become kind of a neutral third party because I don't, you know, none of them are my boss. And so I'll Switzerland, you become bit, Switzerland, a little bit, uh, Switzerland that knows each person's, personality and communication styles. So I talk with one partner who says, okay, this is what's on my mind. How do I communicate with this other partner about this? And I'll help them craft the way they speak about it. And I'll do the exact same thing with the other person. That way, everybody understands what's being said, what people's needs are. Uh, and there's not communication and confusion because if you have two different people coming at it with two very different styles, like you're talking about, they're going to misunderstand each other. And that just makes the whole process. I mean, it makes it take longer. It makes it more strenuous and stressful. And all of that stuff translates into more time and money wasted. And so if you can cut out the clutter, cut out the confusion and the miscommunication and the friction and the frustration, you're not only going to save yourself a lot of hassle, but you're going to end up saving your company a lot of money. Okay. Uh, and that's incredible that you can see that. And you as a person, it sounds like you get to put on a counseling hat a lot. Um, I try to use the word coaching just to be safe. You know, um, <laughs> counseling right? is, uh, is telling you some things. Coaching is letting you tell me some things. And so, uh, I, I'm definitely, I call myself a team consultant and an Enneagram coach. Okay. And so um, that's two different hats in itself right there that you're consulting and coaching. Um, now, and that you have to have those hats in management as well and in leadership. Do you get into that as well and the differences in, you know, mentorship versus coaching versus counseling versus the different leadership hats? Do you get into that as well? Absolutely. Uh, you know, everybody has different leadership styles and I think that everybody has potential for leadership, right? Leadership is just influence. Everybody's a leader regardless of what your actual title is. And so I love getting to work with teams holistically and help each person understand the different ways that they can influence, lead others, you know, around them. Uh, and so, yeah, absolutely. All those different hats come into play. Okay. So let's try to make this somewhat applicable to the salesman in the insurance, in the insurance world. Is there a way that once you've gone through this test with you, that if I'm selling to someone that I could be able to recognize a number they might have to be able to relate to them or to translate into a sale or. So there's a lot of different ways that you actually start to maybe assess what somebody's type is without having an assessment, right? You can't know for sure, uh, but you can 
some pretty educated guesses at it just because, you know, we said earlier, even if you have several different types that are influential with you, uh, it doesn't matter if it's your main type or not. If you resonate with something a little bit, then it's helpful to know that. And so I can tell by, by words people say, phrases that they use, and even body language sometimes. And so when people go through that kind of training, you learn how to pick that stuff up a little bit uh, and, and kind of intuitively. And it could be used in a really bad way. It's one of the things I teach people not to do. It's not about manipulating others, but it's about understanding what others' needs are and meeting better than you would have without understanding that. And so, yeah, I think for a salesperson, if you can use this to try and understand better the are of your potential clients or customers, you can meet their needs better than another, you know, agency or whatever it's, it's trying to work with. So working with Evergreen could help their closing numbers go up. Um, you could help close more deals by working with Evergreen. Uh, agency principals hear that out. Also with customer service people, if you're on the other end and you've got this guy, and as you know, agencies, you know, you get screamed at a lot or you get, you're working with people in their worst times when their house is yeah. flooded or they've gotten a car wreck, you can be able to read some of that uh, and maybe you can be able to help with that too. Am I right? Absolutely. Um, let me give you a really practical example. You work with a lot of realtors, right? As an industry. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. So, so real like realty work is an uh, area that just, I don't know, it came to mind. I thought it might resonate uh, well is let's say you had a realtor that was trying to sell a house to somebody or not a house. They had somebody looking for a house and they were trying to find a house for them, right? Some Enneagram types, uh, I'm going to use you as an example, as a type three, you know, type threes, one of the things that they care about is perception, right? They want uh, a house that looks awesome, that their neighbors is going to think looks awesome, that their family is going to think looks awesome, right? But there's other types who care more about safety and security, right? And maybe that means the house that isn't the tallest on the street or that you don't even see from the street, right? The, the house with a big hedge in front of it versus the house that everybody can see from the entire cul-de-sac, you know? And so just having that kind of stuff in mind as you try and serve clients is one of the most practical, applicable ways I know of uh, for, for people to use this kind of knowledge. That's a really good example to throw that in there because we do work with realtors a lot. We also work with a lot of mortgage people uh, and lenders who are very influential upon their customers. Um, and so if we know we're working with some of that influential, we've got to learn how to read that because they're the ones who are driving our business a lot of times and driving our referrals. And we're very referral driven. So I'm, I'm imagining using the Enneagram, you could learn how to read those people as well. Not only that, but also to communicate in a way that makes the most sense to them. Yeah, for sure. Um, so yeah, um, I, I would love to continue to talk about this and I would love to do a part two on this. I know that we're running low on time right now, but um, I would love to give you, and again, I say this every week, this is one of my favorite parts of the show. I'd love to give you the floor for the last four or five minutes. If there's any piece of advice for an agency owner or for a business owner, something you would like to just leave with them or some gold nuggets, as I like to say, that you'd like to drop out, um, take the floor for a few minutes and uh, mm. give us some advice. Man, that's a, a great setup and I'm not sure. Um, you know, yes, I would say if you've ever traveled to another country, right? Americans, I don't know if other countries are as bad as us at this, but one of the reputations that Americans have for traveling to other countries, places that don't predominantly speak English, is that we're not very good at learning other people's language, right? Um, you know, when somebody goes to a place that doesn't speak English and they want to know where the bathroom is, do you know what they say? No. What's that? What's that? They say, where's the bathroom <laughs> in English, right? <laughs> really loud. Very loudly and usually multiple <laughs> times over and over again, as if just doing that is going to magically make sense all of a sudden to someone who doesn't speak English. <laughs> right. We're, we, we do that. The problem there to at home a little bit is that we do that also personality with the things that motivate us is I don't really try to learn what motivates you. Instead, I just use what motivates me in an even more brave and of night. And so I end up driving people away or not connecting with people could have otherwise, if I would have done the work while traveling abroad to maybe learn a few words in their language, right? And so if I can actually learn a few words in your language, in your 
motivation and personalities, I can connect with you in a way that's much more responsible and mature and authentic rather than the equivalent of just yelling bathroom very loudly over and over and over again. And if leaders can learn how to do that, <laughs> and teach their team how to do that, uh, then then everything gets better, right? And so it's good for your team, good for morale, for your turnover rate. It's good for your client closings. It's, it's good for your financials, for your bottom line. That's fantastic. And I love that you ended with that for this episode, because whether the audience likes it or not, we're going to talk about more of this. Um, and I would love for you to also share some contact information, email address, phone number, if they want to hire Evergreen or hear more about Evergreen or Ryan Mayfield for that matter, uh, tell them how they can get a hold of you. Yeah. So probably the easiest things to do, you already mentioned my LinkedIn. I'm over on there if you want to find me personally. Just uh, And then if you want to connect or check out stuff with Evergreen, uh, the webgreenteams.com. And like he said earlier, it's spelled weird. It's E-V-R-G-R-N teams, like plural, dot com. So evergreen without uh, all the E's except for the first one, evergreenteams.com. Okay. And did you say your email address? Uh, the best one there would be hello at evergreenteams.com. There you go. Okay. Uh, man, I really I really think that you guys need to, to talk to this guy because, uh, you know, there's so much you could do for your company, for your agency, for your sales, for your customer service by using the Enneagram. Um, Ryan, I appreciate you coming on with me. I appreciate you taking this time. And uh, we're going to have to do a part two, whether it's recorded or not. (laughs) I'm down. That sounds great. All right. Well, thank you again, man. Absolutely. Hey, guys. Thank you so much for checking out my conversation with Ryan Mayfield. I really hope that the content we brought you today added value to you, and I hope that it helped you in some sort of way today to become a better insurance professional. That is the goal of every one of these podcasts is to add that value to you. Um, I really do hope so because I know it's added value to me since I've gotten involved with the Enneagram, since I've gotten to know Ryan. You really ought to check out his LinkedIn uh, at Ryan Mayfield. He's got all kinds of articles. Once you take the test and figure out your number, There's some cool free stuff on there. Or you can reach out to him. Uh, He left you his contact info and hire Evergreen to come in and do some work with you and your agency. I really think it'd be a a value add to your agency as well. I got to let you know this podcast is brought to you by Ready, Set Podcast. They make it so easy for me. They do all the recording, the editing, the publishing. All you really have to do is have a microphone, a voice, and something to talk about. He takes care of the rest. Ready, Set Podcast, turning your brilliant idea into a reality. Thanks again, guys. Come visit next week. Have a good one. Hey, thanks for joining us today on another Enneagram podcast. As fellow leaders, we know it can be frustrating when it seems like you always run into the same problems on your team with the same people. But leaders just like you are learning how to lead their teams better using the Enneagram, and you can too. So if you like what you heard today, we would love it if you would share this podcast on social media. And leave a rating or review wherever you listen to podcasts, preferably only good you know, reviews and ratings. That would be great. If you'd like to connect with us, you can find us on Instagram or at Another Enneagram or head over to our website, anotherenneagram.com. Thanks for listening and we'll see you on the next episode of Another Enneagram Podcast.